it out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Okay, this is Energy Week with George Harvey and Tom Fennell. I'm George Harvey. Here's I'm Tom, Tom Fennell. Fennell. And here's Mark Crowther, who is our guest. He's going to be talking about aquaponics. And what we're talking about <clears throat> here is aquaponics, <clears throat> which is a system in which fish are grown with plants. And the fish produce waste, mm -hmm. urine, feces. They, are, they go through a system where... B b bacteria alter them and they go to the plants which use them as, as uh, fertilizer and then the water is returned to the fish refreshed. Mm -hmm. And the production that you can get out of this is unbelievably big. And in terms of energy, it is uh, a huge energy savings because you don't have to transport the food, you don't have to transport fertilizer, you don't have to make fertilizer, you don't have to destroy the land, you don't, there's a whole bunch of things you don't have to do. Uh -huh. You've got a bunch of fish that are growing there, you've got a bunch of vegetables, and the numbers that I'm seeing say that 40,000 pounds of vegetables and 20,000 pounds of fish per year, per acre, in um, heated, lighted greenhouses. Uh -huh. So now um, I'm back to Mark Crowther, who's going to tell us how it's done. Okay. Um, well, thanks for having me on, inviting me on the show. <laughs> and um, I um, have been, I've been experimenting with aquaponics for about a, a year and a half now, and um, have a blog on Reformer 802 um, that's called Brattleponics. Um, and what that is is creating workshops and systems around the uh, Brattleboro area, and uh, you can find it uh, by looking for Brattleponics or markcrowther.blogspot.com. And um, what we're going to do is, is talk about aquaponics, give a little context of where it comes from, explain how it works, and uh, you know why we should be practicing it and talking about some of the, the benefits, solutions, and implications. And, and certainly this is a... Um, format that I, I've used for different um, audiences, and, and so we can you know, keep it kind of mm. fast and loose, as we say on the radio. But um, here's hydroponics and see, aquaculture. Yeah, we can see really we're combining uh, soilless gardening with raising aquatic life. Um, and I was always interested in, in keeping fish as a kid. I had fish tanks, I think, before our first bigger pet, like a cat or a, a dog. And, um, you know, and I saw that when I put a plant in the tank, the, the fish did much better. And um, then about 20 years later, when I went to uh, um, a university and I saw that the, the tilapia were being grown um, in the same tank as the duckweed that was feeding them. And it was a really symbiotic kind of relationship. I saw that uh, it was something that I wanted to explore it further, and I, you know, I started at home. Tilapia love duckweed. Yeah, and <laughs> duckweed grows very quickly, so, you know, it, it seemed to be something that was that was very popular. But mm -hmm. up here in Vermont, I thought, and this is in the dead of winter. I mean, this was last January, um, when the cabin fever kicks in. I went down to my basement and I started building some designs. Um, I thought, well, what can I do that's more space appropriate to my situation, but also our climate. Because um, one of the problems with tilapia in Vermont is that they, because they like it nice and warm, and it's a tropical fish, that um, that's a lot of energy just to heat their tank. And, and so I thought, well, maybe I'll explore with some, some other fish that uh, are more suited to our climate, and we'll, we'll get to that. But um, here you can see, uh, uh, really beautiful design. Do you uh, happen to know where that was taken, that picture? Um, I'm not sure. I think it might have been, um, might have taken this from uh, an Australian source. Okay. There's a lot of this yeah. going on in Australia. Yeah, absolutely. And, and actually one of the, the gurus, uh, this guy named Murray Hallam, is, um, is a worldwide kind of expert. 
yep. in, in aquaponics. And um, one of the websites that I learned a lot from and, and designed my systems from uh, it's called Backyard Aquaponics. I and think a lot of people have learned a lot from that website. Yeah, and that's just a tremendous source. So a lot of, I think the, um, you know, the web uh, developer there um, at Backyard Aquaponics is, is from down under, as they say. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, here's sort of a, a generalized idea of how it works. We're recirculating water um, using about 10% uh, of the water that you need in soil-based gardening because it gets recycled. And what, some of it evaporates. Yeah, so. and the plants transpire some water, so you lose a little there, some of it evaporates. Which happens in normal fields, but you don't lose Absolutely. any, it, mm -hmm. it just doesn't run off. And so, so what we're dealing with is, is just topping off a system as opposed to starting completely over. Right. Uh, or, you know, letting the, the water leach into the, you know, the, gr the ground. Right. And then it's it's gone. Right. And one of the things with that particular picture, if you could put that back up, Tom. The, the, that particular this picture. This one? No, no, the one, the, the, that one. Uh -huh. the, the, um, that picture, you know, when I got into aquaponics, I was, the thing that bothered me initially was the plants, these lettuce plants are going to drown because their roots are in the water all the time. But the, uh, the, it turns out that because the, the water is oxygenated, the plants don't drown. The, the reason why they drown when the, wa when the land is covered with, with uh, water mm -hmm. is because they're in soil that prevents the oxygen from getting to their roots. That's right. So, uh -huh. they, so, they, so they drown. drown. But in a system like this, once you've removed the soil, you've removed the thing that makes them drown. Mm -hmm. you know? And they will grow in this. And the number of plants that will just grow. If you, you can have a, the simplest aquaponic system, you have a fish tank. You have plants growing in the water. That's right. That's the simplest. That is so simple. And you can have a couple of goldfish and lettuce, and that's just a start. Mm -hmm. Or you could grow mint. And if you really want to be less imaginative than the idea, though those ideas, you could wa grow watercress. <laughs> you know, that's to, why they call it watercress. That's why they call it watercress. <laughs> and you can grow that just by going down to the store and buying watercress and putting it in the water. Yeah. Because it'll root in the water. But the, the fish will eat it unless you can keep the, keep the fish away. <laughs> right. Yeah, and, and, and there, there are so many designs. And, you know, and one of the things I really love about aquaponics, you know, is that as I start to explore another design, I start to get inspired by, you know, people who have already done this and, yes. and learned the hard way. And, and the great thing with YouTube and, and the Internet, where I get a lot of, you know, these uh, particular kind of, bits of information to, to help me make it work. Um, it's just the accessibility of it. And mm -hmm. so um, really, I, I tell people that anybody can do it. I think that's true. And, and I think that if, you know, for the parents out there, if you're thinking, OK, well, I want to give my kids some responsibility, teach them how to take care of something, well, sure, they might, you know, they might be interested in the goldfish for a little bit. But if you also combine that with a plant, then they can see, oh, that, you know, these things work together. Mm -hmm. There's a relationship happening. Mm -hmm. And if they see that their plants are growing, then that can be a little more engaging, I think, in the long run yep. to keeping that uh, interest going. Although they may be distressed if you try to talk them in eating their pet ca uh, carrot <laughs> or pet lettuce. How lettuce. about their pet watercress? <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, we know this has been going on for thousands of years. I mean, these are... Uh, the Aztecs practicing aquaponics on floating rafts, and in other parts of the world, you know, they're um, using the fish to, to cultivate the rice paddies. Right. And um, carp, for example, will eat the rice midge, which is something that attacks the paddy. And so not only is the rice growing from the, the poop that the carp make, but they're keeping healthy. And, you know, pesticides, natural pesticides. Right. Basically. And I have read also that in China now they're starting to experiment with other crops mm -hmm. that, that benefit from the same kind of thing where they can keep those fields flooded basically year-round growing crops and fish in them. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and they don't need a whole lot of depth. Um, and in terms of the whole, you know, the whole symbiosis that we're, we're talking mm -hmm. about, you know, we know that... Um, What's good for the plants 
um, you know, is also good for the fish. I mean, they, yes. they depend on each other. Right. So there's this independence, interdependence that happens. Right. And um, and these little microbes that you know, like I, I say, uh, they do the heavy lifting. They're almost invisible. You know, it's kind of the slime on the tank. Yeah. But that's what uh, turns the ammonia into a nitrate and then nitrate. Nitrate, yeah. And we've got um, a little um, visual here that kind of right. shows this is uh, what the nitrogen cycle is and yeah. and the whole idea is, is to make sure that um, we can keep that um, unbroken. Unbroken. You have right. to keep this going for the sake of the fish. Right. If you don't have this cycle going in a fish tank, the fish will die because you'll have a buildup of ammonia and it, it will kill them. Mm -hmm. So even if you're not growing plants, you you need to cycle that fish tank, as you would know. Right. You know, you need to cycle the fish tank so that the um, so that the uh, the fish have the the microbes that are involved. You can't just scare away all the all the bacteria because it's really bad and it'll it, the fish will die. Yeah. They depend on those bacteria. Right. To keep them clean. If you don't have a big enough screen out there, you might yeah. not be able to see some of the writing, and it explains it quite well. Fish and plants growing happily together. We'll start up in the upper left corner where it says plants absorb nitrates. Fish, and then on to the next one, the right one. Fish excrete ammonia. Then down to the lower right corner, ammonia converted to nitrites. Just what you were saying. Yeah. Mm. And into the last one, Nitrites, nitrites to concentrated to nitrates, and then back to begin the circle again. Right. Plants absorbed to nitrates. Right, right. My God, how the money rolls in. Yeah, and <laughs> what happens here, of course, is uh, let's just say that you were you were growing you were uh, these are uh, vegetarian fish, and you can grow tilapia, so that they're basically vegetarian. Oh yeah, they they'll eat anything, but yeah. but you know that you can grow them as vegetarian fish if you want to. I don't think it's as good as letting them eat. Daphne and worms and whatever else they come across, but um, the the input into that system that would that would increase the amount of energy and thus increase the mass of the fish and the vegetables is sunlight. Carbon dioxide from the air, carbon dioxide from the water because the fish are respiring, oxygen from the air and water that all goes in. Water goes in, but basically the the real driving force here is sunlight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and. Um, and you know, uh, my my system started uh, not in a fancy greenhouse, but in a in an office with two windows that faced west. I mean, I, I didn't even have southern exposure, so I, I did have to supplement uh, my setup. Do you have a with, picture of that? With some overhead um, loops, and yeah, we we do have some photos. So. We'll get to them. Um, we'll get to them. I, I guess you know, I just want to uh, touch on before we get into the technical stuff. You know, why we should be doing this. Um, we know that it closes energy loops as well as um, the nitrogen cycle loops. Uh, we know that plants grow faster and less space. Um, we see that instead of roots going out, uh, the plants will mine for the roots by going down. Mm -hmm. And so you can grow uh, much more densely packed. Uh, Good point. You know, vegetables. And Good point. we're just trying to. Um, replicate what happens in nature. Right. And this is called biomimicry. And, and one thing that's very important about that is mm -hmm. that people should understand it is easy to do this at home in a way which is 100% organic. Yeah. So yeah. the biomimicry is the thing that gives you that. Yes, yes. And, you know, instead of uh, importing our, our lettuce across the country, uh, I mean, the average... Um, Produce comes about 1,500 miles when you go to the store. You know, you can just go into the other room, say you need some herbs for, uh, you know, you need some rosemary for your, your uh, roast chicken. You just go over and clip it off, and there you go. And You, you can don't do even it. have to go outside. No. No, any time of the year. <laughs> and, and, and so it's, it's pretty amazing how that yeah. really reduces the amount of energy you spend going to the store. And if you, have a, if you have a bunch of lettuce, you can take one leaf from each. That's right. And they just keep going. Right. And if one leaf is shading a smaller plant, well, you know that's the one to pick. <laughs> and that's the one you're making salad with that night. Yeah. Uh, we can do this with a uh, uh, half gallon. Uh, we can do this with uh, probably a quart of water. You know, if you had a, a little uh, Siamese fighting fish 
and a, right. and a little <laughs> plant. Um, I, you know, I've got a $10 or a 10 gallon system, which I, I figured cost about $50, including the gas it took me to go to the store and get all the stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and it's still oh, going. Oh, boy. Uh, it's very ener energy efficient um, and uh, uses just a few watts of energy. Yeah, so. it's amazing. You know, I've got a pump that, that supplies a grow bed. Mm -hmm. And it's in a 150-gallon tank that has about 20 goldfish in it. And in the grow bed is a 50-gallon grow bed, that, which has a bunch of lettuce in it and stuff. This is really an undersized... It's an oversized system for the amount of fish that I've got, mm -hmm. very much. But the pump that I'm using draws 13 watts. Yeah. And it cycles that 50 gallons four times an hour. Right. Right. And, um, you know, that's a lot of aeration. Which it's a lot of aeration. The, the plants and the, the fish yep. need. Yep. Um, and, you know, there's no weeding, like you said before, so it saves you time there. And what you plant, uh, you pull out, and there's, the maintenance is very, very low. Um, and I really appreciate that. Um, there's a lot of great reasons to, to practice in Vermont, too. We know that there's a lot of fish and plants that we can use that don't require a lot of energy yep. to heat. Fish are amazing creatures in terms of heat. The goldfish that we've had, now we're in our fourth year. Mm -hmm. The goldfish that we had bred the first year. Yeah. And they've bred every year since. Right now we've got 75 or 80 fry in a 300 gallon tank. We're not feeding them at all and they're growing like mad because they're just They're reproducing natu themselves. Natu natural stuff that, well these guys are eating anything that's in there. Yeah, yeah. Which is mostly algae. Mm -hmm. the, I'm, t I'm talking about fry, you know, these, when, when goldfish hatch, they look like a whisker with eyeballs. <laughs> you know, really, they're so small. And, um, and Tori had the, the, the amazing good luck to spot these things at a time when she had a stereoscopic low-power microscope uh -huh. available to her so she could watch the embryos develop inside the eggs. How neat. And then she could watch, she actually watched goldfish fry hatching. Wow. And then watch, cool. watch them absorb the, the yolk sac and build their, their swim bladders because they, they hatch without swim bladders. Oh, I didn't know. And, you know and, then, and then watch them grow. And they can grow astonishingly fast. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the, uh, the, the um, no, what was I going to say? I didn't tell you, so you don't remember. <laughs> 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 Let's keep going. Yeah. So um, anyway, just talking about, you know, things to think about uh, yeah. when you're, you're considering. I aquaponics. remember now, it was when, when winter comes in our greenhouse, it freezes. Uh -huh. The water freezes. We had ice four yeah. inches thick on that 300 gallon tank and the fish were underneath that swimming around, yeah. perfectly happy. They, so they survive. They survive just they fine. They probably could even survive a little bit of freezing right in the ice. Oh, I don't know, but yeah, I would <laughs> guess if it was a small amount, but we had all, you know, we had a lot of fish, and the only ones, of course, that we had yeah. at any time that would not survive that were the tilapia. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. And uh, you think about the average temperature in Vermont, it's yeah. 45 degrees. Yep. You take the whole year and just, you know, average the whole thing out. And so, um, so that's why I, you know, was really more drawn to the, the cold water things um, in terms of species that would grow. And, and also the plants, because, yeah. you know... Um, in the middle of winter, you know, you need, you need those B vitamins, right? Uh, so, yeah, let's, uh, th this gets into some of the kind of um, detail here, but these are some of the um, things that I've been experimenting with, lettuce, salad mixes, those are good year round, mm -hmm. and um, they grow really quickly. Um, basil is a little finicky because sometimes uh, it, it doesn't like too much water, but uh, cilantro's done well. Uh, here's a picture of my, my parsley from last year. Um, the herbs, uh, I think, are um, always useful because uh, when you go to the store and you buy herbs, you know, usually you have to buy more than you use. Oh, yeah. And it's nice to have, you know, rosemary or, um, you know, in this case, cilantro parsley. Um, Chives still, these are water-loving plants. So yeah. um, there are some things to consider, you know, to consider in terms of the, the fish themselves and, um, you know, matching the space that you have for the size tank in the room right. is as important as how big the fish will grow within that 
yes. tank itself. Yes. And so, um, you know, we know goldfish, they will get as big as the space that they have and, and yeah. outgrow it like, like some tropical fish, too. Um, so, you know, the idea is about an inch of fish for every gallon mm -hmm. of water. Um, but um, you want to think about how big that fish is going to be when it's fully mature and not just when you put it in there as a little baby sometimes. The little baby is pretty small. Mm -hmm. These are some nice pictures. Now, these are, these are pictures from the Vermont uh, Fish and Wildlife website, which is a terrific resource. Um, and the Vermont Fish and Wildlife uh, stocks are watersheds with rainbow trout, brook trout, brown trout. These are, you know, the fish um, that um, do, can do really well with aquaponics. And the state will also supply um, a consumer with rainbow trout if they, if they um, are going to grow them in an, in a, in an, uh, in an agriculture, agriculture or aquaponics. And one thing right. I should point out here is some of these fish require cold water. Yes. And if you have an aquaponic system in a greenhouse mm -hmm. or out in the bright sun mm -hmm. and it's not very deep, trout might have trouble with it because it might get, particularly the brook trout, right. get too warm for them, it'll get too warm for them. Right. The brook trout are, are definitely the most cold-loving fish, and that's why you'll find them in little streams that are spring-fed and, and uh, definitely keeping the temperature within a range yeah. is something that's critical to your success yeah. um, because we know that um, rainbow trout, for example, can handle a higher temperature right and and so can brown does your presentation go into into the golden shiners yeah a little bit okay um i've been experimenting with these uh fathead minnows which um you can find uh Never. more easily in the winter months uh with the the vermont state bait dealers right but you can catch them in the wild you can catch them in the wild um and golden shiners also you can you can catch in the wild uh, the ones that um, that I've been getting are just from the local um, spring water bait, right. and um, and you know they run I think December to April, right. um, and that's pretty typical. But uh, these are fish that are able to to stay alive, and now that it's springtime, they're they're breeding. So mm, right. you know the fatheads get up to uh, it hits like sixty four degrees, and then they start to change color and. Yeah. And they might not look like this image here. The males look very different from that image, as a matter of fact, because they, uh, they have that fat, blunt head, which they didn't have a few months ago. And they, they seem to have kind of vertical bands on them. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> and, um, and they're only like three inches long at maturity. Right. And so, you know, for a 10-gallon tank, these are a, kind of a nice option. Yeah, I've read say. that and actually observed that fathead minnows like to be in groups. Yeah. And uh, particularly the females would get upset if there's not enough fish in the group. Mm -hmm. And they'll do with six or eight. But they need to have a flower pot or, a, or a something, you know, that yeah. they can go to the underside of because they... They, they can hide. Well, they, they deposit their eggs on the undersides of things. Oh, okay. So if you have a flower pot sitting on its side, mm -hmm. they'll deposit the eggs inside okay. the flower pot. Okay. Yeah. And if you can watch that then you, you really can know that the fry are about to hatch. And at that point, probably the best thing to do would be to take the fish out and put them in a different tank so the fry can grow. So they don't eat their own fry. Well, they generally don't eat their own fry, and neither do the golden shiners uh -huh. if, if, they, if they are fed enough. The goldfish will, and the large goldfish will eat small goldfish. And that's an interesting paradigm because if you think about it, Mm -hmm. these, some of these fish, the goldfish will lay 2,000 eggs. The golden shiner, if it's big, will, will, mm -hmm. lay, will lay over 100,000 eggs. Yeah, wow. and, and the shiner will get up to 9 or 10 inches long. And so the, that's a lot of eggs. It's a lot of eggs. Yeah. But when these fish do that, the expectation is that most of those eggs are going to hatch into, into fry that don't live very long. And those fry go out and they harvest mm -hmm. microscopic life that the goldfish themselves would not eat. Uh -huh. And when they come back to mama, well, mama is eating 
her farm, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not exactly the way human beings do things. This, but. this seems to me to be a fascinating thing for school-age kids. Oh, yeah, this would be a wonderful thing to put into a, school, into and, a classroom. And, you know, in, in some places, um, I should say in, I say in the States, but, you know, I think with uh, kind of the increase in, in uh, STEM, what we call, you know, science, technology, mm. and engineering, and math, um, we're seeing that, and, and more people going into trades. Yes. This is becoming more popularized, and um, I think in my uh, next blog post, I've got a, I've got a design. Actually, my current blog post this week was was showing a middle school from uh, Hawaii, and what they did with a simple tank and some PVC pipes. So. I can um, see in, in not very many years this being a legitimate profession. Oh, I think it, I think it's rapidly developing yeah, into one yeah. worldwide. It's uh, you know I could, I think it's something that I think would actually it already has. Um, there's a there's a, a large aquaponic system I don't remember the name of in Chicago, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a neighborhood thing where people in a in a as I understand it a slum neighborhood have taken over a well warehouse and have a large aquaponic system in there. Mm -hmm. And they're using that to produce food, which is used locally. That's right. So Yeah, we're, we're seeing Chicago, Milwaukee, and these places um, that are urban centers, right. which were really, you know, as we say, they're, um, you know, they're food deserts. You know, you go That's through these areas it. and all you can get is processed foods from say, um, uh, you know, like a, a chain 7-Eleven or something. Yeah. It's, you know, and the uh, supermarkets, you know, are basically trucking in all their food as well. And so it, it's a way to get the, their community involved in growing their own You know, food. As, as you say that, it reminds me of the thing that Prince Charles did where the Duchy of Cornwall, he went to, is, he's the Duke of Cornwall, so he mm -hmm. went to his tenants and said, I want you all to be uh, organic in your yeah. farming techniques. And the result of that was that they started, for the first time in, in a long time, actually prospering because they had vegetables that could be sold all over because of their quality. And as I think about what you're saying, I'm thinking you could have a farm in Chicago or Milwaukee. You could have a farm almost anywhere in an urban area where you can get, particularly in rundown neighborhoods, cheap property. Mm -hmm. And you could be selling your absolutely glorious organic lettuce to right. high-priced restaurants, <laughs> yeah. and it could be coming off the field, if you want to call it a field, and going straight to the restaurant and consumed within, actually still, you could, it could, the, the chef could cut the roots off and, and put it on the plate. Yeah. And um, it, you we're talking about something which is exquisitely fresh, and, and uh, it could be a, pro, uh, a farm product of, of uh, uh, a slum neighborhood. Mm -hmm. If you if you look at uh, growing power, for example, that's a nice yeah. um, example of, of um, inner city uh, development with aquaponics. Um, of course, you know some people are living in different climates and you know have other um, fish that can tolerate much higher temperatures too. So we could, we could talk about those. Actually, the, you um, know the golden shiner that we just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Those, according to the uh, McClarney book, which came from from um, New Alchemy Institute, yeah. the data that they have in there says that those will go up to 100 degrees for the water temperature. Yeah, they're very hardy. And, and the, I see you've got the... We've um, got the yellow perch, they're very hardy too. And the brown bullhead, we have sure. a brown bullhead that Tori found on Flat Street. Yeah. Oh, on Flat Street. Actually, she found it on... on She's walking LA, down the street. On, on, <laughs> she, really? She was she was out on it wasn't Flat Street it was uh, Frost, Frost Frost Street, Frost Street. which of course is Flat Street just yeah. a block up, uh -huh. and um, she found a brown bullhead after um, after Hurricane Irene, mm -hmm. along with about forty minnows and a crayfish and a bunch of other stuff, and she got the minnows and the crayfish and the brown bullhead and the minnows went back into the whetstone, mm -hmm. because that was a logical place for them but the, that brown bullhead did not belong in the whetstone. Mm -hmm. It probably came down from the lakes up in, in mm -hmm. Marlboro. And so we didn't have a place to put it. Mm -hmm. And the people at the, you know, the people at the Vermont fi uh, Fishery, what's, what's the, the name? Vermont Fish and Wildlife. Fish and Wildlife. They're mm -hmm. wonderful. 
in helping people about aquaponics. They, they just love talking about this. And by the way, I should mention one of the things that they told me was that you need a, a license, but it's a very cheap license to get to, to breed minnows for sale as bait fish. Uh -huh. And the, the man who was there was just, he wished somebody would do that in Vermont because we are importing our fish from Arkansas. Arkansas. And we would, have, we would have healthier fish, but also we could grow um, golden shiners four inches long and use them as bait fish. And mm -hmm. it's very hard to get fish that size, which are used in Vermont. Right. And it, the, the, it, we're talking about a market here that is ready, mm -hmm. but there's nobody it in it. It seems like a natural. It seems like a natural. Mm -hmm. And it's not that expensive to start a thing like that experimentally. Unfortunately, yeah. carbon harvest went a little bit overboard. But one of the, the things that um, the, bio, the state biologist told me was that, be, you know, the whole reason between um, Vermont getting the fish, the, the bait fish from Arkansas, was that they come from these huge fish farms where they're tested for, like, numerous kinds of viruses right. and, and bacteria um, and made sure that the sample that they, you know, ship up in these huge 18-wheeler tanks, mm -hmm. you know, um, what, hundreds of miles, is, is that they want to make sure that they're not um, bringing anything that's uh, going to be harmful for the, the water body in which they're put. Mm -hmm. Right. And so uh, one of the rules in, in the, the law book is that if, if you're, um, you know, fishing, uh, for minnows in that body of water, you can only use those in that same body of water. Right. Now, having said that, yeah, I think there's a huge opportunity, you know, here in Vermont to be uh, growing the kinds of things that we don't need to be depending on Arkansas. Right. That's so. absolutely correct. Yeah. And um, the other thing that I was going to say about the brown bullhead mm. is that they will, that's another fish that will live in a tank with a whole top of the tank frozen over. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, they have an interesting habit, which is that when it gets cold, mm -hmm. and depending on the fish, that could be 60 degrees or it could be 40 degrees, they will drop to the bottom of the tank, try if there's mud down there to cover, cover themselves in mud, mm -hmm. and hibernate until spring. Yeah. So you don't feed them during the winter. That, that's right, because we know like um, what happens in the winter when you go out ice fishing. Well, the warm water's not at the top anymore. It's at the bottom, yeah. It's at the bottom, and so that's you know, naturally where they want to go, like um, maybe like a burrowing frog or something, right? Yeah. They go to where it's the warmest. Yeah. Um, people have been experimenting with all kinds of stuff, and yep. uh, the tilapia are certainly some of the fastest growing, um, right. and they're very prolific. Um, right. But I've been interested. This one surprises me. I didn't think you could grow uh, shellfish. Yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. And, and actually, the, the University of Ohio um, or is it Ohio State? Anyway, they've been doing a lot with a freshwater prawn because people who have shellfish allergies have been able to eat prawns um, because they they see that the allergy actually came from the salt water. Oh, they're really? pretty tasty. Their their um, their blood has a different biology uh -huh. ah. if it's in salt water, and so these freshwater prawns are very um, adaptable to a number of ways to to cook. I guess thinking it back, you know, about how these systems work, uh, I'm currently setting up one of these um, kinds of designs called Nutrient Film Technique, which is more popular with hydroponics. Right. Um, but basically taking um, a small submersible pump um, and, you know, lifting the water up into these uh, trays and then just a very thin film of water will keep those roots nice and happy and they can grow out of cups in the top. So there's not much water there? Not going through the, the, through uh, the part system. up okay. above. That's right. Yeah. It looks like a V8 engine. And, and in does. fact, um, <laughs> you know, you were talking about different pump designs and how you had like a 13, 13 watts. watt. And, and uh, on YouTube, there's a, uh, a really ingenious guy who converted an air pump, which was two watts, yes. into a water pump. And so we're talking about a very small amount of energy. Was that was this just bubbling air into a pipe and then the yeah. pipe? That the, the, that's the airlift pump. Right, and this airlift pump, I think, is um, my next project here with the NFT, the nutrient yeah. film technique. We've got. Uh, Give me a, a moment. 
You just keep going. Yeah. Right back. What we've got here um, are the, the first two designs I created uh, called Grow Bed Media Design. And I started, do you recognize those? What, what these are made out of? Yeah, the drums. Drums, right? Yeah. These are 50 gallon drums. Yeah, these are uh, 55 gallon um, drums that are used for, um, for food production. Uh, the ones I had had uh, some kind of soybean oil in them, so they just need to be rinsed out. And um, these are used for, uh, you know, water, basically. Um, with, um, I mean, you can put anything that's, that's food grade in these. And I, what I did is I bought three off of Craigslist, cut the, uh, one of them in half, and with a jigsaw just put one on top of the other and, and cut some holes in. So the fish are down below, and I've got a submersible pump uh, raising the water about, what, three feet um, to a bar. And that goes across the, the top. We've got uh, grow bed media of expanded shale. So this is shale that's been through a kiln, and it's very lightweight. Is it frack shale? It's, <laughs> they didn't put that on the bag, so I hope not. But, um, but it's quite a bit lighter than, say, pea gravel, which you would, say, pull out of a you know, nearby river or yeah. whatever. And um, because of its porosity, it, it lends itself really well for aquaponics because a lot of uh, those helpful microbes are living in the, um, the holes and the rocks. So not well, that's only is interesting. it more yeah. lightweight, but um, uh, what we have here is a, a bell siphon in the middle that every say 15 minutes will we'll flush and flush that water it fills up uh, just below the surface of the rock and then it, every then 15 it flushes minutes will through. flush back down just like a toilet mm -hmm. and it's just a, a simple bell siphon design and i might mention something here if somebody's watching and looking mm -hmm. to get into this a good source of drums yeah in town okay there's the bread company down by the cotton mill hill oh that's good to know uh, they give some away, they sell some cheap, uh -huh. and they also have these big uh, cubies, not cubies, uh, totes. Right. 50, we'll get into them because you got some pictures of them. Then they sell, but they're all filled with food grade stuff. Right. So there's nothing in there nasty, you know, yeah. it's not petrochemicals. Well, don't use the black ones because those do have the, the toxic stuff in them. You want to use the well, you're probably ones. not going to get toxic stuff or from a bread company. Ones. No, no, but if, if you come across a black barrel, Probably better to, to uh, leave that I didn't know, but it's good to know. Yeah. Okay. And and I think you know in terms of total cost, I think you know with the light fixtures, I I think I was looking at about uh, hundred and fifty dollars for for one of these. And, Sounds like a good investment. And, and that was really up uh, by like fifty bucks just because I I uh, bought the rock and I didn't use. Mm -hmm. you know rocks that I, I mm -hmm. could have found just um, because really it's a lot of weight um, mm -hmm. one of those systems has about 30 gallons of water in it and water is what eight pounds, eight pounds. A gallon. so we're talking about 200 240 250 pounds right? yep plus uh, maybe 100 pounds of rocks and so you gotta make sure your floor is strong yeah enough. so I thought you know I want to take it easy on the structure of the house and and since uh, my uh, barrel ponics, and, and I found this design from a guy on the, um, that website, Backyard Aquaponics, that we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then, the one on the right is, has sold, and I've uh, made space for a new one. Um, I think it was that same Backyard Aquaponics where I found the single barrel design. Um, the grow bed media is, is using that, you know, the media of rock, and in this case, I think it's... Uh, Hydroton. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but it's used in, in um, hydroponics. And I have no idea what it is. They're basically these clay balls. Uh huh. And um, it, and I didn't use those because I I couldn't find those actually. Uh, so I went with the expanded shell, and I designed uh, you know the T barrel design here on the, the picture on the right, the, the barrel on the left. Looks to be a mo little bit more effective. Yeah, well, you're basically You've got more, doubling your more space, growing space, right? yeah. And and as long as um, as long as you have enough grow bed media, and I think you know we're talking maybe 
eight inches minimum, you know, you're, you're good to go. So um, to ramp this up to another scale, we, you know, we know it's scalable. You could use uh, Yeah, these were the, uh, the totes I referred container. to. Yeah, and just by cutting off, you know, the, the top third and flipping it upside down, filling it with grow bed. And, so you're uh, using only it. one. Yeah, but here you, yeah. Can, you can create a whole lot more produce. And of course, with a uh, tank that size, you could grow tilapia out to plate size or whatever fish you're growing. So. These you could get at the bread company. They've had food in them, uh -huh. but they do charge for them. Yeah. But well, it's not much. It's five, ten bucks, something like that. Really? No, it's more than that. You, well, you, they, they probably found that market will support there, more. There are places in Vermont where you can buy these things, and my recollection is that um, they will they will sell barrels. A lot of people. Well, I ju you were out when I mentioned it. The the bread company here in town. Yes. Has these things and give them away or selling them depending upon. All right, I should go over there and check yeah. that out. Me too. Um, but they're 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 companies that specialize in reclaiming. Yeah, all the good things. stuff they got locked in a trailer. The the free stuff they leave <laughs> uh <-huh>. outside. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, well, that's that's good to know. Um, and we know there's a the most ancient you know way of of aquaponics is deep water culture, where we've basically got the plant roots floating directly, making direct contact with the water, um, and. Here, you know, we call it a lettuce raft, I guess in my case. We've got a, an air stone uh, providing uh, oxygen to the roots. And so um, there's no uh, bell siphon, for example, which, you know, oxygenates the roots. It's, it's just an air stone. Now, the, the fish would be living in that. Yeah, so you, and... Um, Again, and, you, you'd and, have to worry about the fish eating the roots. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and you so also you choose to... your fish carefully, what? or your roots. Well, really, if <laughs> if you if it bothers you, you can you can you can separate the plants from the fish in some way by having a, a little screen, screen or something area. like that in there. But yep. you have to be careful. Anything you put in the water, you have to be careful with because if it's made of metal, for example, uh -huh. yep. you wouldn't think about copper. But mm -hmm. it can leach, right? It yeah, can leach. But you yeah. wouldn't think about copper being a problem. Yeah, but fiberglass certain... wouldn't be any kind of a problem. Fiberglass is usually not a problem. But mm. copper, for example, will kill certain kinds of aquatic life, especially mm -hmm. uh, shellfish of one kind or another, the snails, the crayfish, the shrimp, and so forth. Yeah. <clears throat> it's very destructive. And I understand that there are fish that object to, um, object to zinc as well. Uh -huh. But uh, as long as it's not leaching things, fiberglass right. is probably okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really hard to escape plastics. Um, and, you know, in terms of the, the raft itself, a lot of commercial um, hydroponic companies use like an expanded uh, closed cell foam. Styrofoam. Styrofoam. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we know that if you go to, uh, a, say, a construction company and you get that blue board or that pink board, well, that stuff's got flame retardant got in it. Got bad stuff in it. Yeah. You know, that yeah. would be going into your system if you're growing in it. So I sort of modified this and just put a um, plywood platform on top of the tank and then set the, uh, the plants we have into used, holes with that. We have used styrofoam that was inserted into packing uh -huh. for holding TV monitors and things like that, and that seems to work. The stuff that's just white. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I, and I, I don't know for a fact that that has nothing offensive in it, but... Right. You know, uh, there are certain plastics that are supposed to be good for this, one of which is polypropylene. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Various types of polyethylene are That's supposed right. to be okay. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the, these are things that can be done. I want to point out that air pump, and you mm -hmm. mentioned it before. In a system like that, that air pump draws almost no power. They, they run at two watts, yeah. a lot of them. We're talking about a very small usage. Yeah. And... Um, you know, a lot of uh, potential gain. And, and obviously, you know, one of the biggest challenges is how do you maximize your yield with the amount of energy going in? Mm -hmm. In a successful system, you've got more plants and, you know, more food than right. the energy you're using. And it just takes a little bit of tweaking once you have it up and running. But these are very simple 
uh, designs to build. Well, that that so. one that you just showed is the kind of thing that, you know. A, yeah. A high school, a, a grade school teacher could with a with a tank could put one of those things up for almost no expense. Yeah. Populate it with tiny fish, and um, and have a have lettuce growing in the classroom. Yes. Yeah. So. And one thing that's that's great about um, <clears throat> fish tanks. I mean, if you're looking for a fish tank, is that there's probably somebody out there who's sick of you know dealing with their fish tank, and so people are practically giving them away. And, mm, and right. I've picked up two free, like mm. thirty gallon tanks. If you go down to um, uh, what is the place that the hospice runs down by the, the yeah, the thrift shop, thrift shop, the hospice. They occasionally have fish tanks. They occasionally there. have yeah. fish tanks, and the and the local exchange programs. Very often, you'll find people giving them away. Yeah. So, um, so these are some designs, and, and of course, um, you know, thinking about, well, what design do you want to try? Uh, the grow bed media, um, you can grow big plants like tomatoes, or you can grow, you know, little lettuce. If you're trying to um, kind of start out, I think probably the grow bed media is, is one of the easiest ways. Um, now, where do you start. get media? Well, I ended up buying mine from uh, Vermont Hydroponics. Which is in? And I think they're in Bennington. Bennington. But they were kind of coming through the area, so I, I met the you know, this uh, is funny because delivery I, guy halfway. I, I, I did exactly that. Closer. I, I called them and I said, I don't need it now. Uh -huh. If I can get it in the next six weeks, that's fine. If you could just bring it to Brattleboro. Yeah. And they brought it for free. It was three weeks into the into the thing, but they brought it for free yeah. and called in advance. Very, very uh, uh, easy place to deal with. Mm -hmm. And the expanded shale that I got was a good product that, that uh, people, you know, you, if you think about working with shale in a bed like that and yeah. digging your hands through, you don't really, unless you've actually dealt with the stuff, you don't know what it's like. Yeah. It's a very <laughs> different product from what you would think. It's, it's almost... It's it's like dealing with marbles or something in terms of how abrasive it is. Is it really? Oh, it's very. It's, it's not soft. abrasive. It's, it's very soft. It's not like lava rock, for yeah. example. Yeah. And it's also very very light. Uh huh. Because it's been expanded, and so when you put water in, it it floats some of it, mm -hmm. not all of it. But the one thing you've got to do is wash it. Right. You because it's all dusty, and you don't want your fish to be exposed to all that junk yeah, in the water. Yeah, because it's gone through the kiln. The you know that will go right into your fish's gills and kill them right away. So you have to wash it thoroughly. And that's probably the, that was probably the most maintenance Probably a good I've, idea I've across the board, isn't it? With the whole aquaponics. Yeah. Um, so anyway, talking about uh, maintenance, uh, may require more maintenance. Yeah, well, part of the grow bed media is making sure that uh, your water is flushing clear before you're adding fish. Um, and we know that, uh, you know, these are heavier systems because you know, the weight of a raft, a styrofoam raft, is a lot lighter than, than a rock. Um, we've got, you know, some other uh, considerations here, too, with uh, the lettuce raft. It, it's easy to build. Uh, it can run on a two, you know, a two-watt pump, as opposed to the, uh, the other one I'm using is like a 16-watt pump. But, um, but we know that the um, heavy plants can't really tolerate that. So you can't grow like a big squash or a big tomato. A little cup like <laughs> I can that. see the pumpkins floating on top of your tank. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that, you know, they're not going to like that. I, I think, this fascinates me. Yeah, this hybrid design is, is kind of uh, taking these recycled plastic bottles, um, basically lifting the water to the top one, and then it goes through each bottle and uh, waters each plant on the way down. So I looked at this, you know, I said, boy, are they bottles? And then I read the bottom. Yeah. Uh, so you got a bottle hanging upside so down Coke attached bottles. to a, a pole. Yeah, well, one end of the bottle goes into the, the butt end of the, the next bottle. Okay. And then a hole at the, the top um, or on the side for the, the plant to come out. So, you so know, where are the fish? So the fish are, you know, can be in a, um, in a tank, tank below down below. That. Okay. Another okay, way of doing yeah. a very similar thing is to take a is okay. to take a, a a large diameter pipe, plastic pipe, slice it about halfway through at at intervals, and then heat it up and push those slices in, mm -hmm. so that you've got an open thing, and then down below that it's pushed in to hold 
the medium in there. Mm -hmm. And then there's another open thing below it. It's like a strawberry tower or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And, and in fact, you, I've seen people planting strawberries in, in systems like that where the water yeah. is just constantly running through. And of course, one of the advantages of a system like this is not only do you not have to weed, Right. But but you don't have to water, yeah, know, because it's because constantly it, going. Right, and, it, and like they say, you know, it always rains with aquaponics because you're recirculating, you know, you're recirculating the water constantly yeah. through the whole thing. It's a beautiful gardening system. Now, what is this? Well, this is a, a mashup of a compilation of of all the different kinds of available systems. So okay. this is a display. Yeah, this is a display of a fish tank going into. Raft method, we can see there's a you know foam on top. Mm -hmm. uh, the um, goes into um, this uh, second stage uh, filter with bell siphons. So basically, uh, the water gets um, purified, right? Mm -hmm. You lift the solids out before you bring it into the uh, nutrient film technique, mm -hmm. uh, which is just a thin trickle of water and then into uh, gravel-based methods. So this was... You got these all hooked together, don't yeah, you? Yeah, this yeah. is really just to show you that some of the different, yeah. I, I, you know, most popular have ways. You, to, you have know. you worked with Beto buckets? No. Okay. I, I mean, this is, this is one of the things that's really fascinating about this. Modern aquaponics has only really existed for about 20 years. Yeah, that's right. Uh, despite the predecessors going back as far as human beings can remember and more, um, it's, it's a... There's a lot to the science that's very new. Mm -hmm. And it's the kind of, we're at a point where an ordinary person, you know, a housewife, a guy who pushes a broom, can, can be a major researcher. Right. Really. Yeah. This is, this, a person who wants to do research and loves finding new things can get into this and within months be developing things that, that were previously unknown or unimagined. And uh, this, in, in many, many respects, in mm -hmm. terms of the species that are used, right. the, how they are used, uh, the plants that are used, the, the interactions between things, the types of equipment, the whole thing. Major developments are yet to come, for sure. Absolutely. And um, we're, we're kind of pointing at the Midwest. Yes. Uh, you know, some of the, what we call the, the Rust Belt, right? Yes and how they're converting these industrial spaces into aquaponics. But, but again, it's very scalable. I mean, if you have a desktop, you could put a tank on it and do it in uh, you know, an area as big as you know, your hands. I mean, it yes. doesn't have to start As you pointed out, you can start with one gallon and a better. And it can start out with, with $10. <laughs> if, you know. And there are very few things that are pretty as yeah, a good, pretty can, better. Yeah, they're nice. <laughs> they're nice. So uh, this is actually a reclaimed uh, swimming, a kiddie pool. Ah, uh, a big, oh, a yeah. big pool um, with a small pool. With a little pool, pool floating on the inside. Yeah. And this is one way to, uh, you know, keep your uh, good your, size your goldfish stuff separate. But yeah, those are pretty decent. Those are good size. But what is the what's the cage for? Uh, I think this is a milk crate to it is a milk hold crate, yeah. the um, to suspend. The um, well, it looks like maybe it's. It looks like there are tubes here running into the uh, the grow bed. Okay. But I'm not sure. Maybe underneath. That, that looks like it's 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 at the water level. So there's a plant growing through it. Yeah. That's what it looks like. It may be that that's one of those things where a person's trying to pre 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 prevent fish from getting to the roots of the plant. Uh -huh. You know, we know that there are a lot of good reasons to do it, and you know, if you think about our our culture, um, you know, I think we're pretty lucky in Vermont, where we have more rain than we tend to know what to do with. I, I think last year, about half of the the country was under drought. Yes. And um, so we we're kind of bucking some of those trends, but um, we know that because of the recirculating ideas of using our, our water over and over mm -hmm. and the plants uh, scrubbing the water mm -hmm. and the water only getting better as the system gets more mature you know this is something that's been really um, taking off in developing countries and um, and we're, we're talking about Africa and and you know other continents where yeah. it doesn't rain very much 
This um, is one of the reasons why it's so important in Australia. Yeah. Because yeah. they don't have a lot of water. Um, the amount of water, you know, the whole state of California, they've banned, the, uh, banned irrigation because there's not enough water to irrigate. So the farms out there are basically sunk for, a lot, for the near future mm -hmm. in terms of water. But the amount of rain that they have had would be enough to support this. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's um, you know, something that um, really embodies the whole idea of permaculture, you know, growing multiple species all together as right. opposed to monocrops, which is right. kind of the mm. opposite mm -hmm. of, you know, right. picturing a cornfield. Right. You know, here we've got a, a number of um, species, and, and that's what nature wants. You walk into the woods, you don't see one kind of tree. That's right. You know, you, and you if you did it. see one kind of tree, you'd be missing a whole lot of other things. Where you have a monocrop forest, you very often don't have any birds because yeah. there's no insects in there. Or That's the, interesting. Yeah. yeah. You like in South Carolina where they got miles and miles and miles of pine forests. Well, they, they ha I've, uh, you know, I read about a, a forest in Sweden where they had planted many square miles of, I think it may, might have been pine for paper. Yeah. For paper, yeah. Yeah, and they, they found that this was really kind of a disaster because the only things that would, would live in there were, were uh, uh, insects that would attack the pines. And there were no predators. Even though the predators would attack the insects to keep them under control, they weren't living in the forest because there weren't other things that they needed. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it, human beings really don't understand things as well as they th would like to think sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with these things, you know, I said earlier that the that the, the input is the sun. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to grow uh, gamerous, for example, amphipods that that can be used to feed fish, which are like tiny tiny shrimp, okay, you can grow those. They eat bacteria, and of course they're a little bit big to, to find individual bacteria. Uh, even an animal that size wouldn't be able to see bacteria, hmm. but what they eat is the Little colonies. The, they eat leaves. Oh, okay. They eat rotting leaves in okay. order to get the bacteria off the leaves. And if you have um, leaves, not I think I think you don't want to put oak in, but other leaves you can just put them into a bucket. And if you have the what they call scuds, you can put those in the bucket, hmm. and just a pile of leaves on the bottom of the bucket. Fill it up with water. Put the scuds in. Obviously, you know, they have to be adjusted to the right temperature and so forth so you don't kill them, shock them going in. But they'll multiply in there and they will, they will provide you a second input hmm. for the fish, providing protein, uh, providing animal protein. And you can put them in and unlike food that you would buy that you put in and then if the fish don't eat it, it rots and causes problems. These guys will stay alive in there until they're caught. So they're just part of the system. And you know it's a it's a it's a it's a beautiful it's really a beautiful system in a lot of respects. Everything eats something else. Everything eats something else <laughs> except the guy at the top of the line, and that's the one you eat. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Yeah. So, um, and, and we we touched on some of these points. You know, it's it's possible to do aquaponics just about anywhere. Uh, it saves water, but we also know that um, you know that are um, natural resources in terms of the ocean, you know, the, that's not looking good in the next. Every time I turn around, I see somebody overfishing their fishery. Yeah, and they're saying, you know, there's not gonna be a fishery in 30 or 40 years. So yeah. it's, you know, it's a way, uh, the biomimicry idea of taking something that works and controlling it, of course, but also only um, enough to increase the pr production, really, is what you're doing. Yeah, but instead of you know going to the sea for what we want, you know we can grow these things ourselves. Yeah. Mark, and we are getting to the end of our hour. Mm -hmm. So well, we're we're at the end of my presentation. At the end of yeah, there we go. This is nicely. that's good. This yeah. this is the end end piece, right? The, the, end the piece. last page. That's one of the things you can get out of the system, which in this case is salad. A uh, nice little salad. Thank you.